Hello, good people of the world. Uh, so today is with Alessandro. For y'all that don't know him, he is an actor, and you might recognize him from Top Boy. Yes, sir. Yes, bro. How you living, Pim? Bro, I'm I'm good. You get me? I like, just coming to the end of the week, just feeling refreshed. I've been working on a lot of stuff. Yeah. Music, uh, scripts, uh, concepts, like everything, man. You know what I'm saying? The work never really stops, so that's how I like it, as we were saying before. You get me? Yeah, 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 yeah. Like to stay active, man. The devil makes work for idle thumbs, right? So you want to keep yourself Fact. busy. Stay out of trouble. There we go. There we go. <laughs> devil yeah. makes work for idle hands. Got to stay as busy as possible. Fact of the matter. What's interesting about that, though, is that, you know, you mentioned like four things script writing, music, and other stuff, and I know your your dad as well, my guy. So how do you balance all that stuff, man? I just do it, bro. And I've got obviously I've got I don't do it by myself in terms of raising my child. Um, yeah. My son's mother raises him as well. But in terms of my, my work, bro, I just I just do it. I, I really don't know any other way to put it. Um, I don't have to. I enjoy it. I enjoy music. I enjoy film. I love theater. I love everything I do. I love raising my child. So when you're doing a bunch of things that are a pleasure to do, none of them is ever really a chore. Truth be told, bro, I'm sort of living, I don't want to say so cheesy, sound cheesy, but sort of living my dream. Can't lie to you, man. Can't lie, yeah. It's not, you know what, it's not cheesy, but it is rare to hear. You feel yeah, me? Yeah. It's rare to hear, man. Like, you don't hear many people saying they're living the dream. And no, you don't. Like, for the most part, when you hear it on TV, someone's living the dream by not doing anything. Like, you know, they just... They've, they've kicked the feet up and they're just chilling, cruising on a, yeah. on a huge like, yacht or something. That's them living the dream. But to, some, to hear someone living the dream is them being active and being busy and them looking after the kids and them doing stuff. That's dope to hear, bro. It's, it's motivating. Thanks, bro. Oh, man. And, you know, like, having a child, man, is like, of all of those, that's my favorite thing. I can't lie yeah. to you. Like, by far, bro, it's like the sort of, he's, ugh, man. It's the cause. It's the cause. Yeah. You know, his existence is the reason why all of the other things are a joy to do. You know, yeah. just trying to make my mark, you know, achieve, 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 achieve. And really, it's not, it's going to sound weird, it's not necessarily to achieve in order to aspire him to achieve. I want him to achieve, but it's not to inspire him that I work hard. It's just to, to make sure that he's safe in the sense that I want to secure his future. So I've got to work my ass off financially. Yeah. In order to make him secure, when I pray for him, that's one of my prayers. I always yeah. pray, give myself and his mother the means to be able to provide for him constantly yeah. without any trouble. That's actually yeah. one of my prayers. I pray every night. You get me? That's sick, bro. That's that's hella motivating, man. You know what? We might as well start the other way around, bro, because we're on this topic already, man. Like, um, you know, I, I had I had an agenda for our chat. You know, I like to keep things yeah. formatted or structured, whatever, right? And I'm mm -hmm. going to start with the more political stuff kind of thing but i feel like we're on this topic already so might as well stick with it this topic of right. familyhood right mm -hmm. um you and i i know we, we spoke about this before so like obviously you got you got a son um how old is he again two and a half it's two and a half it's more right? than it's over two and a half now but yeah yeah it's two and a half yeah dope right um so you, you know the old school stereotype yeah you know i mean black men don't look after the kids black men don't stay black men mm -hmm. like whatever right like you're completely flipping that stereotype the other way around which is which is dope yeah. you feel mm -hmm. me in one sense but also i feel like it's so deep because now everyone's talking about black lives matter what do black people do to to make themselves better what's wrong with our communities and you and i pointed to this being one of the core things that a lot of people might miss or don't even look at the familyhood yeah. the togetherness uh -huh. you know, sticking, yeah. with, sticking with the family sticking with the wife and I mean, sticking with a partner. And the thing about you that's always interesting, interesting to me is the fact that you said my um, my son's mother is still in the picture. Like, you guys are co -ha like co co-parenting. Yeah. Successfully. You feel me? So can mm -hmm. you tell me a bit a bit about that, about your thoughts around being a, being a black father in this community and stuff? Yeah. Man, see, fatherhood, right, mm. is something you've got to step up to. I have I've a belief that women, you know, motherhood, um, they carry the child in their womb for, for a good nine months, ten, ten months. Mm -hmm. And over that period, even before the child is born, a very, very, very strong connection is mm -hmm. built with the child. 
very strong connection that is just internal. Like, let's even forget about emotional psychology. A biological bond is built. In fact, this biological bond that has been built is so strong that when a baby is born, it's a scientific fact that the baby doesn't even recognize itself as being a separate entity from his mother. It's still one. It's right? still one. It's symbiotic. Exactly. Now, that's that. On another level now, hormonally, you know, a woman's body goes through a lot while she yeah. was pregnant, like, I don't know if anybody's ever watched a movie called Mother, but I mean, that tries to explore it. But getting back to the topic, a woman's body goes through a lot. Oh. Um, and on an emotional level, on a psychological level, like the bond, on an instinctive level, the bond is really one of an inseparable nature. Okay, there are conditions, there are forms of depression that women can go through just after a child is born, like postpartum depression, et cetera, et cetera. But the point I'm trying to make is that when a child is born, when a child is inside the mother, yeah. it's like, it's, it's, it's a seed and it's, it's just a seed. They are both a seed together, if you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And then once the baby is born, that connection there, she hasn't just met him. Yes, she has just met him in reality, but instinctively, they've yes. known each other for eternity. You know, a woman's seed, seeds have been in her since she was like five years old. Her egg, sorry, have been in her since she was five years old. So yeah. that relationship is one that I don't even really think can be put into words. All right, so as a father, you don't have that nine months to, to carry the child with you. You don't. You won't breastfeed when the child is born. Yeah. The main job of a father when a child is just born really is to accommodate the mother and it's to just make life as comfortable for her as possible. Support. And then you have to do your thing in terms of helping her get rest when it comes to supporting and looking after your child. Right. But, you see, the brutal truth of the matter is fatherhood doesn't fall to men as naturally as motherhood falls to women. No. You know, I, this is my opinion. People can feel free to disagree with me. I'm, I'm bothered. This is just what I think. It doesn't fall as naturally to men. Men, I believe, have to step up to it. I believe women come into it, mm. you know, within reason there's obviously exceptions but i think on the most part women come into motherhood men have to step up to it and in stepping up to it it doesn't happen quickly bro like i, I might even use the phrase climb up to it men have to climb up to it because it is an effort to understand what you have to be as a father for the first so ever, however howsoever many months of a child's life you don't even understand what's going on you've just got a baby and in the truth of the matter is you don't really serve any purpose to the baby other than just being a person that's there Mm -hmm. You're of more use to the mother than you are to the baby because you allow her to rest when basically you're holding it. But then even then, a woman's instinct for the baby is so strong, she doesn't even want to pass it over. I'll be mm -hmm. true with you. She just wants to look after the baby mm -hmm. herself. Mm -hmm. You have to earn the trust of the mother in every way. Mm -hmm. You have to earn... Because if, you, if, the, if the mother doesn't trust you, then she's not going to allow you to sort of... Um, you know, the she won't allow you to give your interest. Yeah, she won't allow that bond between, not that she won't allow the bond, but she won't be as trusting in the potential for the bond between you and the, the baby. Yeah. But in doing that, all this, you know, the, the common things that happen with men, you know, especially like in our community, is, is the whole, they leave, you know, they're hot and cold, they're, they're there one minute, they're gone the next. Yeah. That doesn't do anything to, to bless the relationship you're going to have with your child or the mother. What mm -hmm. you have to do as a man is you have to, you got to do a lot of thinking. You will not chart. You're not. You're not going to change that. That when the child is born. You. I, when my child was born, I was still the same guy. Mm -hmm. uh, when people I changed me, it didn't change me yet. My view of life changed, but my insides, my mind hadn't necessarily changed. Who so you were. Yeah. For the whole first year of being a father, I hadn't changed yet. I was. Don't get me wrong. I was doing my thing. Bro. I was getting my child on a weekly basis, mm -hmm. and I and I loved my boy. I loved my son. I love him. But I hadn't yet made the ascension that you have to make in order to be a father. Mm. And I don't know how it happened, bro. I think there came a moment in my life where I just said to myself, like I'm, I'm 27 years old. There came a moment in my life when I just said to myself, I've lived as carelessly as I wish to live. Mm. You know, bro, I've done the parties, the girls. I've, I don't even want to say it, but the drugs. Bro, I've done it. Yeah. I've done that stuff. Yeah, I don't care to go out. I don't care to just be head mad, mad social anymore. I actually have something in my life that I care more about, way more than all of those things. Mm -hmm. And that is my child, bro. It's my so, child. So I actually am scared of the idea of him not being raised by both of his parents mm -hmm. because he needs the influence and the leadership of his mother. And he absolutely, just as much as he needs that, needs the influence of his, and leadership of his father. A child should, in truth, be raised by two people. Mm. I was predominantly raised by one person, my mother, an incredible human being. 
But a child should be raised by two people. Why? Because, number one, it means less stress for the person who's doing it, i.e. the mother in most cases. And number two, it helps to create a well-rounded human being. This is not to say that people are not well-rounded if they're raised by one parent. I'm trying to say you are more likely to be well-rounded if you are raised successfully by two parents who are able to get on, cooperate, and liaise successfully in order to raise an incredible child. And that's the fact of the matter. Mm -hmm. So I... Bro, I had to step up to that plate and I had to say to myself, you know what? Like, for example, I for most of the time, for the first year of his life, I wasn't living in the same area as him and his mother. I was living in East or North and they were living in Northwest. And, and I had to move to Northwest. That's like one of the first decisions to make. Mm. Do you, you know, like, the reason why I was wanting to stay in East or North is because I wanted to be near my mum and my brothers. But bro, 27, I've had years to build on that relationship. I lived in my mum's house for what, 19 years. Yeah. Th- that relationship is not at any... That there's not at any risk. No, we no. built it. That was years and years of nourishing for that relationship. It's We're great. Me and, my mom, me and my brothers will never have a problem. I lived with them my whole life. Now, this is the new relationship I've got to put into. Yeah. Relationship with my son. This is the thing that I have to put into. And that means it's not that I need to be near my mom and my brothers. We've got that closeness in the heart. I need now to be near my son so I can achieve that closeness with him, which means being able to see him every day. Mm-hmm. which means being able to just take him to the park whenever I want, which means not living in a way that he, that he sees me as part of some structure. We have to have a biological flow, bro. Like, okay. I've got a friend, a really, one of my really closest friends, she's got a daughter and she's not with the father. And he, he lives nearby. They just weave in and, in and out of each other's lives like this, bro. It's seamless. It's seamless. On, on a random, you know, day at four, he can just be like, is it all right if I... Bro? And there's no... She doesn't see a structure. His daughter doesn't see a structured way that he's seen by his parents, by her parents, because yeah. they have made the effort to make sure that the flexibility, the, the primary aim of having flexibility in their lives is to accommodate the child. Mm, 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 and that's what it is, bro. It just has to be child first. And that's the end of the discussion. If yes. your child isn't what you're putting first and you're getting it all wrong. So you yeah. can spend, you, I've got friends, for example, I've got a brethren. I said to him, yo, like, how often do you see your son? And he told me once every two weeks. And in my opinion, that's, I mean, I think that's garbage. Why? How the fuck can you be all right with your son only seeing you once every two weeks? How, what influence are you going to have your son if you're only re- if you're only seeing him once every two weeks, bro? Like on an egotistical level, it frightens me for my son to reach the age of fifteen and for us to not have a lot in common. Mm. The idea of that actually, like, bro, that that's like a panic attack idea for me. Imagine my son being fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. I can't sit down with my son and talk to him about just normal life, about girls he's seeing about football, about films, about music. The idea that my son sees me as just like, oh, this guy that wasn't really there for me much when I was growing up, go to hell. So even on an egotistical level, beyond a moral level, my ego is bruised at the idea of him not seeing me as somebody he can vibe with. Yeah, that's what yeah. You get me? So for me, fatherhood is a very, very simple thing, but it's not easy to achieve. You have to step up to the plate. Mm. Mm. You have to step up to the plate. And if you don't step up to the plate, then the child will never come to you. You know, it's not a, it's not the ch- the child's job to come to you. You have to go to the child. Yeah. Right. It's as simple as that. When a child is born, a, no a no little child of four years old, five years old, six years old ever comes to their mother and father and says, "Thank you for giving birth to me." Yeah. Yeah. It's here, bro. Like he didn't ask to be born. Yeah. <laughs> he was no, it's born. Real. It's real. He was born. <laughs> you, it's yeah. your job to be to be a parent and fulfill what he needs as far as love, guidance, support nourishment, mm. education is concerned, bro. The, the role of a parent, to call it the most pivotal role in society is, is an understatement, bro. Mm. It is it's crucial, bro. It's like, it's, it's, it's central to life. It's central to life. So I guess what I'm trying to say very simply is that for me, being a father is a case of stepping up, is climbing. You have to make that climb and you have to be prepared to give everything necessary to make sure your child understands that they are loved that they are respected and they're able to now project that back onto the world mm. because no human being can project out what has not been put into it itself if you're not trying to say like you raise a child with hatred and then it's like i always say this year if you want to create a horrible dog a violent dog then raise it in a horrible way yeah right if you want to make a loving sort of familial dog then you raise it with love and with familial values right Cool. The same with a child. Mm. Discipline, education, generosity, mm. 
manners, politeness, self-respect, mm. self-empowerment, mm. self-belief, confidence. All of these things come from come from the parents, and and if if they're not coming on a regular basis, it, it won't work. This it can't be patchy, man. It can't be patchy. You know, let's just think about something normal like playing piano. They say it takes ten thousand hours of practice to be good at anything. Yeah. So how many hours does it take to raise a child that is well rounded? Mm. Mm. And that's more just than ten. Imagine a person. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's my that's my perspective on fatherhood. That's real, bro. You've you've touched on so many like valuable pointers there, bro. Um, one one core one which I really love is the idea that the child doesn't owe you anything. You need to work nope. to get the child's love. You, like your mm -hmm. your whole your whole life is based off working to earn this child's love, kind of thing. Uh -huh. And it's not about you anymore. The minute that child comes in the picture, you become completely selfless. You feel, mm -hmm. and everything is dedicated to the child. And then this this idea that what you put in is what you get out, right? That, mm -hmm. that, 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 that machine, right? The machine of yeah. you, the, the, the seed that you plant comes from how you take care of it, etc., right? And yeah. how it grows is based off the nurturing that you put into it. And um, mm -hmm. that's, that's dope, bro, because I feel like, and I always put this on my Instagram stories, and I, always, and I know a lot of women feel like I attack them, right? And it's not about attack, because I have a lot of single, single mothers that follow me. And I'm mm -hmm. always, you know, posting stuff about, you know, the, 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 the household needs a masculine figure. The household needs a wholesome figure, right? Not necessarily yeah. the concept of you have to live together or be together, but you, you have to work together. And you, you put that perfectly. The concept of make, just weaving in the relationship of your, your, your familyhood, you know, is so important, bro. And that's another thing. Like, when we link it with society, it's like a lot of kids are out there um, single parents or parents that are not showing love or haven't raised them with love for various reasons. And I feel like this, 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 this just comes out in different ways. They, they project that in different ways in society, which kind of sets us back in, in so many different avenues. You got what I'm saying? Because when you start looking yeah. at the root of people's um, emotions and people's behaviors, just, you always go back to the childhood. You feel me? You always go back. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I was talking to a very good friend of mine the other day about you know the, the case of black men not um you know sticking their neck out and well not even sticking their neck out not respecting black women you know that's a that's a, that's an issue in society that a lot of people can acknowledge as being true mm. okay so look, let's just get this straight bro mm. there are a number of reasons for that but one key reason is that on generally speaking a lot of black boys who are not raised with their father haven't even witnessed their mother being shown respect on an everyday basis by a man. So, you know, when people say stuff like, when girls would be say stuff to do, it's like, oh, would you talk to your mom like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they would and they do. Mm -hmm. They would and they do. Mm -hmm. A lot of these dudes, the truth of the matter is, they have not grown up um, watching their mom being shown genuine respect on a daily basis mm -hmm. by a man. That's it. Now, if you haven't seen that, it doesn't imprint onto your mind. Yeah. And, you know, imprinting is one of the key things. Bro, I cannot tell you how much of our existence and how much of what we do is down to what we were subconsciously and consciously taken in from just being around wow. our parents and how much that imprinted on us. Like, for example, right, I've got, I've got two brothers. Of all of my brothers, the one that is most like my parents is me. Mm. I'm the firstborn. frozen uh, right let me just check if it's my connection can you if you guys can still hear me um can you drop a comment please you back you back yeah i'm back i'm back i'm back i thought okay yeah you're here let's go cool yeah as i said i'm the eldest of my brothers mm. i'm the most like my parents my youngest brother is a bit like my parents, but he's very influenced by me. I mean, my next brother, Dan, is a bit like my parents, but very, very influenced by me mm -hmm. and then his own school friends. And then the one after that is very influenced by myself and my younger brother, but then also influenced by his own school friends. Right. As, it, as, it, as it descends, you get less and less like your parents because you've got other influences now. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Yeah. This is what I mean about imprinting. Now, if a child, if a young boy is not there to see his mother... It's one thing a mother teaching a boy respect, but it's another thing to just witness a man treating his mother with respect. That imprints. 
It imprints, and it's as simple as that. And if that imprinting process doesn't happen, then the way you learn to respect women will be by the rappers you listen to, by the influences you have outside of the house. It will be based on TV programs you watch. The influences come from a variety of places. Now, let's just get something straight about a lot of the genres that we like in our black culture. They are largely misogynistic, bro. Let's just call it as it is. Yeah, um, yeah, hip hop and fashion are too, and even to agree, Afrobeats, it's nothing but the constant sexualization of women. Nothing but the constant sexualization of women. Yeah. And if we talk about hip hop, for example, women are casually, I think, are referred to as bitch and hoe more than they're referred to as anything else. Right? Now, yeah. to add insult to that, they're watching things like porn. Dude, there is no way that using the environmental influences of the world that we live in, a man is going to learn how to respect a woman. Not any way in God's earth. Mm -hmm. And your mother is your mother. She's not a girl that you're ever going to date. So the true truth of the matter is, it's very hard to project the love for your mother you have onto girls you're with. And then even so, as I said, when girls say things to a guy like, would you talk to your mother like that? Yeah, they would. They would. Like, I'll be real. They do talk to their mothers rudely. I'll call it as I see it. So... Yeah. I think a big reason for which, another reason why, even if the, the the parents aren't together, another reason for which having the father play an active role in the child's life, mm. whilst also showing respect to the mother and treating the mother, I don't even want to say like a queen, bro, because that stuff overblows it. Treating the woman like the mother, like the mother of their child, bro. Yeah. Like a fellow human being, like the person that is putting their all into mm. making sure that your son... Mm. is a well-rounded and upstanding human being. Yeah. If you can treat a woman like that in front of your child, that affects the way your child sees it. 100%. 100%. Simple. And it affects the way they go and carry themselves with women. And, it, it, and, mm. and bro, by the way, bro, mm. you won't even need to sit down to your son and say, son, make sure... If they see it, yeah. Yo, it's as simple as that. Actions speak a lot louder than words. Yeah, lead by action, do as I do. Yeah. Um, I asked my son's dad if we could just be amicable for our son's sake, and he said no. Yeah. See what I mean? So what he's what that guy's doing there, E Minor, what her what the father of her child is doing there is he's essentially saying, I don't mind if my son grows up and doesn't really treat women with respect. That's essentially what you're doing. He wouldn't admit to that because he doesn't think he's saying that. That's the essence of it though. Mm, mm, mm. yeah i mean this is the thing like and i always back um, bang on about having role models and people that you look up to on various ways you know i mean a lot of the single um, mothers that um follow me um we talk about the ability like i mean i have full confidence in women be able to woman being able to raise children by themselves but i feel like the importance of having some kind of masculine figure that is very important whether it be a best friend whether it be an uncle whether it be a role model in society it's really important, you know what I mean? Because a woman can, like you said, you can, you can tell your child how to behave and what, what to do. But if they actually see it from another person, kids feed off what they see. It's like when you copy things on cartoons and TV shows and just replicate. It's what they see and what they hear. You feel what I'm saying? So it's very, very important. I think it's undervalued by a lot of men in society. And now it's slowly being undervalued by a lot of women as well. You know, and I feel like that's very unfortunate. But, but I feel sorry for women. And I say this, bro, because women... Oh, man. The way men, especially men who are not with the mothers of their child, the way they just are so happy to leave the mother mm. in, a, in a ditch, mm. like, the mothers do incredible jobs, but, but they wouldn't be bothered almost. It's like, mm. there's no reckoning of that fact. There's no recognition of that fact. Mm. Mothers, a lot of single mothers, are forced to just... They, bro, you have to understand, bro, humans have pride. Mm. Humans have pride. Do you know how hard it is for a woman who's got a child of a man, a man who's not trying to play his role properly, to keep begging for the man to do his job? Mm. Keep asking him. Yo, this is your son. Mm. Raise him. This is your son. Show him love. This is your son. We should be amicable for his sake. This is your son. Bro, a woman can't keep... At the end of the day, they love the child. It is embarrassing for a human being to have to beg another human being to treat their own child with respect. Mm. And at this point, the, the mother stops to even think about the fact that, that the child is the other parent's child. And she just thinks, wait, this is my child. Mm. And I'm begging somebody to treat my child with respect. Mm -hmm. This is what I mean when I say something has to switch in the man's head. You know, 
Bro, it's a fact of life, right? Yes, a child needs a masculine and, fe and feminine figure in the house. A child needs to be raised by both. But here's the brutal truth of the matter, right? Mm. Very few women are actually shutting the door on that possibility. Many men are shutting the door on the possibility themselves due to laziness, mm. apathy, mm. the desire to keep being free, the desire to live as though they don't have a child, and the, and, and, and the viewing of their child as a burden. Bro, I'm going to tell you straight up, mm. I do not see my child as a burden. Truth, I see everything that distracts me from being with my child as a burden. Mm. That's a burden. Mm. When things get in the way of me and my child, that irritates me. People call me whilst I'm like legit actively trying to spend time with my son. Mm. I don't answer the phone joyfully. I tell, I tell, and everybody who knows me knows that fact. Mm. Mm. That's it. My son is our main concern. He's the mother of my child's main concern. Who was there first? The mother. I had to step up to her level. Yeah. I had to get on her level, bro. And she and I didn't she wasn't begging me, bro, but let me tell you something. She never ever shut the door on the possibility of me and my child having a great relationship. She kept it open. And I was having a good relationship with him, but I wasn't indulging to the extreme. Now, nah, bro, I'm just indulging to the extreme because I don't see any alternative. I'll, I'll finish this off with saying this, right? I've got this friend who like lives in um Harold Hill, which is far, far, far northeast under, nearly Essex. Mm -hmm. And like he's got a son. When I first met him, he used to just see his son once a week. Mm. And, um, and, and as I said, I, you know, when I saw my son once a week, I would pick him up on Sunday, drop him back on Tuesday, pick him up on Saturday, drop him back on Sunday, Friday, Sunday. It was that kind of thing, like two and a half days every week. Mm. And like the truth of the matter is, I felt comfortable with that. And so did my boy. And then I don't know what happened yet, but like, I think I hadn't spoken to him for a year. We used to speak regularly, bro. Mm. And me and my guy, we hadn't spoken to each other for a good year. And his, him and... My, myself and his brother are very close as well. So whenever I spoke to his brother, I didn't hear him in the background. One day, I just thought, let me kill my curiosity. Yo, why go on for so-and-so? And he just goes, oh, fam, I don't even live here no more. Mm. I said, what? He said, yeah, you don't live here no more, man. He's moved to East Ham. I said, he's moved to East Ham. I said, why? And he goes, he's trying to be with his son all the time now. Mm. So I spoke to my boy. Me and my boy, he's like a big London. He's like just like me, he loves London. I was speaking to him. We all have these conversations about what are your favorite, what what parts of London would you most like to live in? But before, bro, we would go through tons of answers: Camden, Islington, Hackney, Mile End, Wandsworth, whatever. Fam, I asked him now, and he just goes wherever my son is. Mm. That was his response: wherever my son is. Yeah. I said, what you been up to? Blah, 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 and my son. Bro, he was mentioning his son more than he's ever mentioned him in his life. And this is what I realized. Mm -hmm. Yo, my guy has stepped up now. The moment switched. He had that moment when he looked at his son and he realized, if I don't put the work in now, mm -hmm. I might not even be able to be proud of myself for what you've become when you're older. Yeah. Because that's what it comes down to, bro. There, there's a level of ego in it. Yeah. There's a level of masculine ego in this. It's the thing of that same ego that drives men to just want to have lots of children should drive a man to want to raise his child as best as possible. Oh, and there's the disconnect. There's the disconnect. A lot of men in this world are happy to have seven children by five women. Mm. Very few men in this world are happy to have seven children, to have one children by one woman, one child by one woman that they're not even with, and put everything into making sure that child, along with the mother, making sure that child grows up into the most well-rounded and fully fledged person they can raise yeah and here's the disconnect yeah. that's the disconnect so with me i don't have the ego of having a child my thing is oh i'm a man no my thing is yo i just uh, my ego is like i'm trying to direct my ego and my love and my energy and my pride and everything towards my son mm. in order that i can reach the age of whatever when he's like 20 and look at my son and say my god me and your mother, we've got so much to be proud of. We did it. We did it. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, yeah, and that's my aim. No, that's, that's my aim. That's dope, bro. I think it's that it's that switch, that disconnect that you, you've spoken about, man. It's weird. It's the, the perspective that a lot of men have. Um, to Again, to the to the single mothers that, that follow me and stuff like that. I mean, a lot of them say, but what about the guy, right? A lot of them are are, are talking about, but the, the guy's not stepping up. The guy doesn't even want to be, like Imani just said, the guy doesn't even want to be involved. And you're right. What what good? And the 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 title I have for this segment was a father versus a sp versus a sperm donor, right? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like you know what good is it having someone you know impregnate you when that person is not willing to stay? And what good is it you know having a, as a man? What good is it impregnating a woman and not willing to actually raise the child? What 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 is your purpose in life? You feel me? And disconnect is there. Like like you said, where's that pride in knowing that I created this thing? 
and I help this thing become this person that that is you know an outstanding member of my society, my community that I I actually influence, and that thing is not there, and it's weird, man. And um, and bro, it's scary, man, because so many men just love having tons of children. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's bro, I'm gonna tell you this now, yeah. I know this now for a fact. Yeah. Because of just I have a lot of conversations, bro. A lot of men purposely. Oh man, purposely impregnate women. Yeah, like they purposely do it. So they track they just track so they can trap the woman. Yeah. Alright, cool. That's evil. Yeah. That's the first level of evil. Yeah. The second level of evil is when they trap the woman in a cesspit of loneliness to raise a child. Yeah. If you're gonna do the first level of evil, which should never be done in the first place. Mm. The least you can do is be an incredible dad. Mm, mm, mm. The least. Mm, mm, mm. But motherfuckers aren't doing that. No, I hear that. I hear that, bro. And I'm not part of that narrative. No, I appreciate that. I, yeah, I'm not here doing evils when it comes to my child, bro. No, 100%, bro. And I 100% feel like we should push this narrative a lot more. You know, we have a lot of women out there talking about men are not doing enough, but we don't have enough men stepping up and saying, yeah, we actually aren't doing enough. And this is this is the representation of what a good father needs to be. You get what I'm saying? And this is what we need to be doing. With the same conversation that you have with your boys when you clock that someone's actually stepping up, the same conversations we need to be having with, with everyone, every other guy. Like, there needs to be knowing, there needs to be feeling that guilt factor of like, yo, you know what? Maybe I'm not doing enough. And I feel like a lot of guys get an easy way out. Like, when there's, when there's something unhappy or not working right in the relationship, they're like, boom, that's my excuse. I'm out. You feel me? Versus fighting. Yeah. Kick. You feel me? Um, and bro, the experience of raising a child successfully is like, yo, there's nothing more wholesome, bro. Like, I'm all about wholesomeness. I'll tell you that straight up. I used to love this sort of, I'm not going to lie, I used to love hedonism, bro, the hedonistic life of just chasing highs. Yeah. I used to love getting high. Yeah. I used to love, like, just, you know, just being free, quote unquote free, because it's not real freedom. Yeah. If you're addicted to hedonism, you're actually trapped, but still. Um, I used to love that. And I just got, it started to feel like a trap. Hedonism began to feel like a trap and wholesomeness begins to look like liberty. Mm. And wholesomeness is liberty, bro. There's nothing better than just, <laughs> yo, just being wholesome. Bro. I don't want to wax too lyrical about it because it's too cheesy and I'm not prepared to go to that place. I just like to live it. I don't need to just keep, you know what I'm saying? Like, I like to just live the wholesomeness. I'm not trying to describe what it is to other people because everybody else has their own concept of wholesomeness. But mine is one that serves me, bro. And just, just being happy, bro. Happiness. Yeah. Things like depression, yeah, are not aided by not being wholesome. Mm. Real talk. Mm. Like, I've, I've had mental health things before, and I can tell you this now. Every time I've had a mental health episode, I haven't been living my life in a wholesome way. Mm. Now, what I'm certainly not trying to do is draw a line between all people that have had depression and say, the problem is you're not being wholesome. You can live the most wholesome life imaginable and still commit suicide. Mm. That is not the link that's being made. Mm. I'm speaking personally. Mm. But when I live a life of wholesomeness, that's when I feel happiest. Yeah. And having a child makes wholesomeness a very easy thing to achieve. You just have to put in the work, and it's as simple as that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. There you go. 100%. No, I, I really do appreciate that, bro. I mean, putting in the work, having accountability, and giving a damn minute. Like, yeah, you got to care. Those things go a long way. Those yeah, man. Go and you just go a long way. What'd you say? Can you hear me? Say, yeah, say that again. Now I said putting in the work, accountability, and giving a damn will change will change a lot of things. Everything, bro. And it's gotta be and you know what? The more you work at it, the more it becomes an instinct. Yeah. And this is actually another the next part I wanted to make. See, with women, as I said, they they, they have that time when they build the bond with the child inside the womb, and then when the child is born, there's an inexplicable closeness to them from breastfeeding to communication to everything. Even the child first learns its facial expressions from its mother. Like my son smiles like his mum, and I do believe it's because the face he first saw smiling a lot was his mum's. Mm -hmm. It's not just a genetic thing, bro. That's a that's a, an environmental thing. Mm -hmm. Now, like that closeness between the mother and the child is just so real. Mm. And I believe that the instinct, the maternal instinct is something that is very much in place of a woman. As a father, I've got two little brothers, so you could say there was a degree of a maternal, paternal instinct there, but you could say it was probably more fraternal. Mm. Um, you've got to work at the paternal instinct as a father, and it becomes more and more natural, mm. if you know what I'm trying to say. So when my child was first born, 
the instinct I had was actually more, I would say, fraternal. i got to be true with you, bro. It was more fraternal. It was like I had my little brother in my arms. Mm. You get me? Um, and the more I worked at being a father, the more a paternal instinct developed and the more natural that instinct began to feel to the point where by now, the instinct feels like, strong as hell bro like yeah. strong like it, it gets so strong you start dreaming of more kids yeah and, and that's and that's that you get me yeah it's, it's interesting because i think um we want it to be an organic thing it's like we just we just expect it to be like boom the kid is here and everything but it's like sounds like there's still a, a, a lot of work you have to do when the kid is actually there to to build yeah, yourself bro. up versus you know it just it just fitting in because the child isn't coming from you organ. i mean naturally like that so, bro, like, yeah. let's let's throw this into into our our structure of society, right? How things are going right now, right? Um, I feel like you know a lot of direction is lacking in the household for various reasons, man. But let's talk about yesterday's situation. Let's talk about Brixton, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the things that happened in Brixton. Um, people were trying to have like you know a street party, whatever, and then um, police came through, became violent. I think someone actually got stabbed or something like that, from what I heard. Okay. And, yeah, it went it went a bit left. In my opinion, unnecessarily so. You get what I'm saying? And this is like a few questions that I have for, you know, us as a people. And also a few questions that obviously I have for the authorities and the powers that be. You know, I just feel like the certain things, the certain mentalities, as humans, we want to be free. As humans, we want to challenge authority because authority is telling us to behave. You get what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But sometimes, you know, I feel the concept of freedom is, is skewed sometimes. Just like you mentioned that the idea of liberation. You get what I'm saying? It's, mm -hmm. it's freedom is subjective. You get what I'm saying? I feel like freedom without some kind of rules, regulations, and governance, you'll end up self-destructing. It turns into anarchy. You get what I'm saying? And I, I, don't, I don't think those rules, regulations need to come from a higher power. For the most part, they should be coming from within. That, that moral compass kind of thing, which I feel like a lot of people are lacking nowadays um but what was your take on the stuff that happened yesterday bro as londoners we know that there are certain parts of london that we call ends yeah and there are certain parts of london that we do not call ends yeah in america they call it the hood you know whatever the projects the projects are an actual thing but still yeah. in france they call it the bon lieu yeah. there are areas of big cities in which there are ends. That's just a fact. Yeah. What makes it ends? Because, you know, to understand those kids in Brixton, you've got to sort of, you've got to really go from the root. What makes it ends, okay? An utter lack of government investment. Mm. Lots of minority, um, ethnic minorities being gathered in one place. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, no resources, like, you know, a lack of parks, centres, you know, after school initiatives, yeah. you know, youth clubs, like play schemes, you know, bro, all of these things are imperative in order to make the youth feel of use, mm. right? To, to provide the youth with productivity mm. and with something to channel their energy into. Yeah. They have it's funny, isn't it? That a lot of boxers are people who will sort of, lip in the line as far as crime was concerned when they were youngsters and then some older pulled them in and said listen come here and take out all of your anger here yeah. all right so the thing is that in many ways is what youth center served mm -hmm. as a purpose the, the truth of the matter is bro ends the way they're constructed is to sort of maybe not purposefully so but factually so to sort of encourage criminal activity you know, the way estates are built, all the shadows, all the narrow alleyways, the, you know, the bad lighting, everything. And the schools in the areas are often schools in which no investment is put into the schools. Mm. The way these societies work is that if you do not literally have perfect parents, mm. you're almost effed. Yeah, by default. If you don't have a mother... That is like a perfect single mother, which is yeah. very difficult to be. And when I say perfect, this is not to refer to any single mother as imperfect. But what I'm really trying to say is that if she doesn't literally nearly take herself 
that almost like bro it's like oh man it's so hard to explain but what i'm trying to say is that it takes a lot as a single mother or as a single father to understand the world that your children live in live in and to be a bigger deterrent to the outside world than Bro, than anything else. Let, like, let, me, let, me, cool. let, let me let me interrupt you for a sec. Yeah. So Go on. along the, the conversation that I've been having in terms of, you know, the, the importance of having a, a um a double parent family or having both parents mm -hmm. with both. And then people talking about the counter argument was that single parents can raise kids fine, blah 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 blah. And then my core question became what about the influence of um external variables what about the influence of the what about the influence of potentially extraneous variables which you don't even know about um how much can you actually counteract that by yourself and this is the thing like the question always becomes what has more influence the environment or the family and i feel like the stronger the environment and the less hold the parent or the family has on the child be it they're too busy they're always working or they don't give a damn the environment's always going to win and there we go yeah. Fact of life, bro. And and let me tell you something, bro. My like, for example, my mother, who predominantly raised me herself. I mean, my dad was there, but mm -hmm. there was like chapters. But my mom was the constant. Yeah. She just, bro. Like, what I was trying to say was that she took herself to the end of the line, bro. Like to the point by, fam, she was raising three sons. It was bad for her health. Mm. Like you have to actually deep this. Like this was bad for her health. Mm. She was often stressed, high blood pressure, migraines. Bro, this was due to trying her best to raise three sons that would be upstanding members of society. Mm -hmm. None of her sons were ever in a gang. None of, her, none of her sons has ever been involved with the police. I need you to understand where I grew up. I grew up in Leighton, East London, bro. In between, there was a point when a list of the worst estates in London was, was made, okay? In England was made. Mm -hmm. And three estates in my area were in the top six. Mm -hmm. Like, each of these estates I could walk to in 10 minutes each. Or from or Leighton. Or, or, or from my doorstep. There was a point in Leighton where every other week, my when I got back from school, my road had tape around it. Bro, I had more than one day where gang members actually came to me and asked me to join their gang. I got like, th this, th this thing happens, like, in case people are wondering how people become part of gangs, there's many ways, but one of the ways is just an older tries to pressure you into it. This happened to me all the once. I had an auntie that lived on Fatch House Estate. I used to go into that block to see my auntie. It was like, it felt like doing an extreme sport just trying to go there. So now bringing it back to the kids of Brixton. Mm -hmm. A lot of these kids are kids who are from ends, bro. They haven't grown up in societies whereby a lot has been put into them. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a plant. If you don't water a plant, then your plant will just rot. Yeah. Now, I'm not trying to describe these children as being rotten, yeah. but they don't have a positive view of the world. Mm -hmm. They have no real desire to treat the world around them with respect because the, the world around them isn't being watered. It's not, nothing has been put into it. It's like if you walk into a house that's heavily messy, like crazy, crazy messy, to what extent are you going to want to treat that house with any <laughs> cleanliness? You're, you're, not, you're not really, because if it's dirty all the time, you're just going to, you will just, uh, you will add to the society that is around you. Yeah. Now, these kids are growing up in a society that doesn't love them, yeah. in a society that isn't invested in in any way. And they treat the society the way society is treated by, by the big wigs. Mm -hmm. So now we come to these block parties when they're just trying to have fun and let loose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're trying to have let loose. They're trying to let loose because they feel trapped within, within... I mean, a lot of them are black. They feel trapped within the perception that is had of them. Mm -hmm. You know, if you keep telling somebody that they're a thug, that they're, a, that they're rotten, that they're useless, that they're lazy, they'll just, in the end, the desire to prove you wrong goes. It's like what I was trying to say about the mother who's trying to convince the father to do his job, yeah. she will not convince him so much so that she kills herself doing that because at the end of the day, there's a pride in it. Look, yeah. I've got my son to raise. Now, coming back to these kids, you can, if you keep telling them you're useless, you're rotten, blah, 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 bro, in the end, they just go, you know what? I'm everything you think I am. I don't give a crap. And it becomes self-fulfilling prophecy, right? It, yeah, it does become self-fulfilling prophecy because, he, he, bro, love begets love. Yeah. That's the truth. You know, people like level, let's just get something straight. There are areas in London, for example, the London Borough of Camden, right? Mm -hmm. You have whole regions like Parliament Hill, Hampstead, and like Highgate and whatever that are like the nicest parts of London. And then you go just a little over the way to QC, Queen's Crescent, mm -hmm. and it's it's terrible. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Camden Town is terrible. Why? Because there isn't the investment, bro. Same yeah. with Islington, Angel Islington, incredible, beautiful area, right? And you just go to Caledonia Road, there's no investment. Yeah. So Caledonia Road has all the thugs, it's got all the estates, it's got all the crime, it's got all the warring gangs. Angel Islington, where all the politicians live, is fine, mm -hmm. because those streets are clean, those areas look nice, those schools are good, etc., etc. That's what it is, bro.
That's what it is. It's about, I, I really do think it comes down to investment. And that's the reason why people are so desperate to raise their children in nice areas. For example, I'm from Leighton. My child isn't being raised in Leighton, bro. He's being raised in, in the nice part of Northwest London. Is it because I hate Leighton? Go to hell. I love Leighton. Bro. That's my favourite part of London. Mm -hmm. But the brutal truth of the matter is, if I don't feel like the society that I'm raising my child in is one of love and is one in which there is an investment into that society, is one in which love can be something my child just sees when he looks around, then there's no way on God's earth I want to raise him there. Yeah, sure. You know, when I met his mother, she lived in Stepney, bro. The East End, we both lived in East. Mm -hmm. Like, East End of London. As artists, we love the hell out of it, fam. But for a child? Mm -hmm. But with the way the government has neglected these areas, go to hell, fam. We had to move to an area where it was nice. Mm -hmm. And that, and when nice doesn't mean lots of white people, by the way. Mm -hmm. The area I mean is full of black people. It's one of those multicultural areas in London. But it's in a far more loving part of the city. Yeah. A part where there is an investment into just the locality. There is an investment in social welfare. Mm -hmm. You know, because this country's obsession with capitalism means that they only put effort into the place parts of the country that are already nice and mm -hmm. gentrification all that serves to do is basically get rid of who they don't want i.e ethnic minorities they're actually making an effort to try and ethnically cleanse london mm -hmm. so you know the, the wealth divide the literal visual representation of the wealth divide is like canary war bow mm -hmm. canary war bow you understand I me mean? queens caledonian road angel islington mm -hmm. like it's that that's the, the Shadwell Whopping. It's that fan. Like, one half is beautiful. Chingford, Walthamstow. Yeah. Chingford is gorgeous, beautiful. Walthamstow is not. So, yeah. this is what I mean, bro. It's like, if no investment is put into an area, then the area will become what? What? And, and, and what, you, what we're viewing with ends areas you, now. And you mentioned the projects earlier, man. And I know the projects in, like, various, various parts of the states, like in Brooklyn, New York, etc. Um, Queensbridge and stuff like that. It, it is that concept, right? It's a project based around low-income housing, uh, minorities mm -hmm. pushing to a specific part of town to kind of keep them away from the nicer parts of town. You know, keep the rich rich, keep the poor poor. And that, that divide is very explicit by calling it the projects. And essentially, that is what happens over here with our estates and our low-income. Grenfell. You know? Grenfell. Mm -hmm. Grenfell, bro. Yeah, Grenfell. That's just down the road from here. Yeah. North Kensington. It's surrounded by the London, it's the London borough of Chelsea and Kensington, one of the richest boroughs in London. But they wanted the people of that estate, Grenfell estate, they didn't want them there. So they purposely didn't do things that make their lives nicer. Mm. They put some metal plates on it so it looked prettier, but they were not prepared to help those people because they didn't even want them to stay. And this is why to this day they still haven't sorted that situation for all the people. They're still lying about the amount of people that died there. Bro, they're secretly happy that they're dead, bro. Mm. They are. They are actually secretly happy, bro, because they want to ethnically cleanse London. Hence Brexit. Hence, um, what's it called? What's the name of this? The Windrush scandals. Yeah. The Windrush scandals. That was an effort to rid this country. They're trying to create a hostile environment policy because they don't want us here. Yeah. And this is why I love what Wiley said, and I agree with it. This is not our country. We're visitors here. Mm. Mm. And yeah. at some point... Yeah. I've got to take it back. Yeah, bro. And I think you and I were talking about this before, right? And this goes into parenthood and everything like that. Like, a lot of Africans, right, of African descent, like yourself and myself, it's like your parents always remind you that, right? They'll say stuff like, when you leave the house, don't embarrass me. Don't forget where you come yeah. from. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. They say, don't yeah. forget where you come from. This is, this is not your country. And I feel like that generation always had this thing whereby they'd always remind you that, yo, you're, you're, you're a guest here, you're a visitor here, so don't expect to be treated like family, if that makes sense. And because of that, there is this mentality for a, a lot of Africans um, that, look, we can't be wasting our time here. Let's, let's be on point. Not all Africans, but a lot, especially the ones in my circle. Like, we kind of know, do what you need to do to get by. And when you, when you get to situations that are difficult, don't make excuses, find your way around it. It was always going to be difficult for you anyway. Like, you, there's no gifts, there's no handouts, so you don't, it's not your spot. Do what you need to do and make it work, kind of thing. Yeah. And that's the kind of mentality that I feel is lacking in a lot of people as well. Like, a lot of people, again, with this, this lazy concept whereby they feel like they, 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 they deserve certain things, kind of thing. This, this concept of like, entitlement. Work, there's a lot of entitlement there. It's an entitlement Definitely. concept. You feel me? Yeah, I, I don't need to work for it, and no, you have no right to treat me like this. I can do anything that I want, but you're forgetting that, my guy, you're a visitor here. Do what you need to do, figure it out, 
You know what I'm saying? And that leads into okay. our conversation about, you know, the working place, um, the working place, right? So um, a lot of people, know, they know you from you being um, a creative, right? So as an actor, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and me, I work in the corporate space. And we were talking about the, 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 the ability to read the room, right? The ability to engage with certain people in different classes, certain people from different cultures, and kind of find a way in, into those doors, right? Because there's different um, responses to blockades, right? There's different responses to resistance. When someone says you can't do something, there's various ways you can respond to it, right? There is like, F this, this ain't for me anyway. I don't want it, I'm out. F you, I'll go do my own thing. Or there is, it doesn't matter what you say. If I want to get there, I'll get there, right? And that's where adaptation comes into play. And I feel like someone like you has almost mastered the concept of being able to adapt you being able to adapt literally as an actor, but also metaphorically in your actual life into getting to certain spaces on a day-to-day -day basis. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? And like, let's, let's talk about the acting scene, for instance. Like, do you feel like it's, it's mostly white orientated, black orientated, or is there a balance there? What, what's it like? Because in corporate, it's, it's very clear. It's white orientated, but some of us will thrive and drive our ways in. So when it comes to the field of acting, can you speak a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a white industry. Um, the, the title, that's the title of the essay. Mm. The film and theatre industry is white. Mm. And that could almost be the end of the essay. Mm. But still, I'm going to carry on going. Mm. Um, you, as a black person in this industry, mm. yeah, you have to have your blinkers on. You know, it's funny, in white industries, okay, but particularly, no, sorry, in artistic industries, there is a misnomer, a misconception even, that because it's artistic that it's liberal mm. because it's artistic it's free and because it's artistic it's accepted and in many ways a lot of the arts is able to work off of that lie and they're able to get away with things that they shouldn't be able to get on, on the basis that it's the art so like we're free how can you it's like brazil right brazil have this lie that there is no racism there because they try and say oh brazil can't be racist because everybody's mixed with everything it's a rainbow nation but it's the most colorist country on earth mm. so it is racist mm. now coming back to the theatre industry Oh, how can the theatre industry be anything is? You know, we're about expression. Anybody can be what they want. But in, there's a lot of sexism. There's a lot of white, white elitism. And there's a lot of uh, male patriarchy. That's the brutal truth. There's a lot of male patriarchy, patriarchy. Now, the fact is, bro, like, as a result, to navigate this industry, you take two routes. You either go down the route of saying, I'm going to go down a pro-black route in this theatre industry. I only work with the black companies. And I'm not going to name names because I'm not trying to... But they're, they're, they're positive. There's nothing wrong with these companies. They're incredible. But I just don't want to be just saying names. You understand what I mean? Because if somebody takes a clip out of context, I hate having to explain something that was said with nothing but good intention. So there are certain companies that are just... They only do black work. And they are really good companies. And I really watch their work more than I watch any other work. Mm. And that is one lane you can go down in this industry. Um, but the truth about that lane is, of course, not, you know, it, number one, it can be sort of fetishized by the white gays, <gasps> Ooh, black art, where they don't even understand what's great about it, but they just love it. It's like I once said, yeah, that to an all white audience, I could go on stage with my top off and just yell profanities, and they could say it was the greatest piece of art they've ever seen. <laughs> but if I did that to a black audience, I would. I would be laughed off the stage. Not even laughed, just say, what the hell are you doing, right? Yeah. And that's because there is a thing with the white gaze of just viewing black passion as art, as just viewing black pain as art. But we're not here for that. So what these incredible black companies do is they put on works that don't look at black people as being here for their blackness alone. Mm -hmm. They look at us as just human beings, which we bloody well are. Mm -hmm. And they tell stories like Good Dog by Arinze Kenny, yeah? Mm. Like Little Baby Jesus by Arinze Kenny. I keep naming plays by him. Like One Night in Miami by the writer who's, I think it's a female writer, forgive me, I can't remember her name. Mm. You know, like Sweet Like Chocolate Boy by Tristan Finn Adjeni. Mm. I didn't pronounce his name properly. He's Ghanaian, don't come for me, Ghanaian community. <laughs> what I'm trying to make is this, bro. These works yeah. are works that view human beings as human beings. And these are really the works that all black actors should want to be a part of. Mm. We should all want to be a part of it because that side of the industry is healthy, it is well nourished, it's athletic, it's nuanced, it's it's beautiful, bro. Like honestly, some of the best work I've seen has been that work. Mm. The other side of the industry is the white side of the industry, in which, you know, I don't know, like there's one black person per play. Yeah. And you see, 
that is the difficult side of injury to navigate because essentially, unless you fulfill a certain concept of what the great black black actor is, they don't want to give you a chance. Right. So what I mean by the great black actor, I mean like good at Shakespeare, mm. um, very posh voice, mm. you know, capable of doing archetypically powerful male monologues. Mm. Like, it's all this kind of stuff, bro. And like, what they do is, or, or with the black woman, it's like you've got to be able to do like, I don't know, like African American, you say film as well, slave, mm. slave kind of characters, or like just old school 1950s oppression characters, right? Mm-hmm. Or like play the rude girl. They need the rude girl in their place. So you've got to be able to play a London rude girl. Mm. It's these very typical roles that black women and black men are often given in white theatre. Mm. And often having like a white director or a white writer trying to push you to fulfill their stereotype of what you are can be the most frustrating thing on earth. I've had my own experiences of that, which I I won't speak of, but like Mm. I've had experiences of being told to be a version of something that I literally know because it's my life. Mm. And they're saying, no, I want, but we want this version of it. Mm. Now you would never get told that by a black director. You'll never get told this by a black writer because they understand that black people do not fulfill one idea of humanity. Yeah. We are a broad, complex group of people. Yeah. I mean, there are more black people on earth than any other race. Yeah. So the idea that we should be one of anything is actually insanity. But this is often what happens. Now, that's, now, what can make that so hard to navigate is that when you're in the white spaces, often you're not understood on a cultural level. They don't really understand you. They don't understand the world that you're coming from. And as a result, you're having to acclimate and adapt to their world. Mm. And some people are very good at adapting to their world and others don't want to try, which is completely fair and, and very, very respectable. And, um, and another side of it is that some people don't, some people aren't able to, they don't understand it. It can be a confusing, traumatic mm. and panic inducing experience. Mm. Um, and I don't blame any of the two. The one who doesn't want to, the one who doesn't able to, I, my heart goes out to them because they shouldn't have to. Yeah. The other type is the type who has mastered it. Mm. Um, and I would say to them, I say I'm one of these types of people. I've been around, you know, I went to an art school that wasn't in London, it was in Bournemouth. So I was around white people all the time. Mm. And I experienced a lot of the subtle racism and underlying racism and the microaggressions that people that are endemic in the world for black people, especially in the arts. And as a result, I've mastered the ability to not to accept it, mm-hmm. but to essentially fight it without having to fight per se. So I can fighting. Yeah. There we go. I'm able now to navigate the industry, white faces in industry, mm-hmm. with full knowledge that nothing's gonna come at me. Now, bro, there are reasons for this beyond my ability to speak and my intelligence. Mm-hmm. I am a tall, powerful looking black man. The truth is, bro, male privilege plays its part in why I don't have to suffer in this industry in a way that others do. Black women, unless they literally come in there, sometimes with a pitchfork in hand, they get walked all over. Bro, I, I need to cut you short for one second. We're about to go over time, but I want to keep the conversation going. Um, we've cool. got, I think, 30 seconds left on this one. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to um, cut this one off. Let it, I'm just going to post it on my live. People can catch it. And um, in the next, like, maybe um, 31 minute, maybe next minute or so, I'll, I'll plug back in so we can finish this conversation. So nice hold that thought, if you don't mind. Whoever's on here right now, um, just give us one more minute. We're just going to bring it back up. Instagram's got a limit, right? So, 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 all right, up, man. Hit you off, guy. All right? Cool, brother. Love. Yes. See you guys shortly. Yeah, man. No silicone. No silicone. No silicone. Okay. Keeping it raw, keeping it real, real, real.